see so many of you this evening at Glover Cottages in Sydney, and to know that we have a substantial online audience as well for our, for our event tonight. The subject, as you know, if you've tuned in, is modern slavery and the disruption of the liberal international order. Modern slavery is kind of a new word for bad, shocking working conditions, bad pay, all the sorts of things that we associate with third world countries, but which are by no means con confined to them. But some of you may recall that our most recent charter of dinner, which alas was three years ago, uh, the oration that year was given on modern slavery by our patron, Her Excellency, the Governor of New South Wales, Margaret Beasley. And she told us of plans that were in place for New South Wales to adopt legislation and other measures to deal with the problem of modern slavery. A lot's happened since then to make that come true. And one of the things that's happened has been the appointment of a commissioner for slavery, an anti-slavery commissioner. Sorry, I didn't get that right. <laughs> and the anti-slavery commission, it's a bit like people who talk about the Institute for International Affairs as if we organize them. I'm afraid you're on, on your own when it comes to that. But yes, we have the anti-slavery commissioner here tonight, appointed by the New South Wales government. And I'm not going to say any more about it because that's, uh, that's James's job. James Cocaine, relatively recently uh, appointed to that position. Dr. Kane has considerable experience in other international organizations of relevance and um, will be carrying that work forward here in the Institute. So James. Well, thank you, Ian. It's lovely to be back here at the Institute. I was, uh, uh, I think, an intern, like the interns who I've just met, and then a council member here probably a quarter of a century ago to date myself. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be back now and speaking with all of you. We live at a moment of significant international uh, change. We face two significant sources of disruption to the established order, the rise of communist China, and climate change. The international order we know has had a relatively liberal character. Compared to previous eras, the post-World War II era has been both fairly purposive and effective in promoting freedom, individual liberties and human rights, liberal democracy, free trade, and the free movement of capital. Now, this isn't to suggest that the post-war order has lacked abuse of power, domination, and coercion. Many nations have experienced this order as a deeply unequal, uh, as deeply unequal, allowing rich, often white countries, privileges that have sometimes been exercised fairly brutally at the expense of other countries. Likewise, the so-called free market can mask both structural disadvantage and interpersonal coercion. In fact, in some 28 million cases worldwide, by a recent estimate from the International Labour Organization, Coercion in the workplace rises to that level that we call modern slavery. International law and the global order obviously don't anymore tolerate chattel slavery. Legal ownership of another person isn't permitted anywhere, anytime. But, and, and that is the hallmark in a sense of the liberalism of the international order in which we live. But people are still treated as if they are owned. Some people still exercise de facto powers of ownership over others, the test for slavery in both international and Australian law. And this is by no means a purely foreign phenomenon, as Ian was saying. Here in Australia, we see signs of modern slavery in berry picking on the mid-north uh, mid coast of New South Wales, in cleaning and facilities management, uh, in domestic work, retail services, and in the sex industry, among others. And I want to begin tonight by acknowledging not only that we're on the traditional country of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, but also that Australia's First Nations peoples have, in living memory, experienced practices that today we call modern slavery. The liberal international order has not been particularly liberal towards Indigenous peoples, if by liberal we mean respectful of rights and liberties. We owe our wealth and prosperity here in New South Wales to settler policies of dispossession and even assimilation that drove coerced work by First Nations peoples, from agriculture to domestic service, 
not to mention the cross-border human trafficking of Pacific Islanders that we euphemistically call blackbirding. And the intergenerational impacts of those practices are still being felt today. Yet we continue to celebrate slavers and slaving. Right now, I'm living around the corner from a street named after a notorious slaver, Ben Boyd, which just a couple of years ago, the local council refused to rename. Now, as an appointee of the Crown, of the governor, as the state's inaugural anti-slavery commissioner, this is a domestic history I feel we need to acknowledge and in time address if we're to have credibility in commenting on the practices of assimilation and forced labour in other countries, as I will tonight. Still, the history of First Nations experience of modern slavery in this country is a story for others, principally First Nations peoples themselves, to tell. The story that I want to share with you here tonight is a story about how we here in New South Wales are connected into global value chains, into liberalised trade and financial regimes that generate and even sometimes rely on modern slavery and the story of our power, our power to begin to change that. Now, I'm not a foreign policy actor. The Modern Slavery Act of 2018, New South Wales that Ian referenced, which created the role I now occupy, gives the Anti-Slavery Commissioner no authority to speak for any government, federal or state. But it does charge me with advocating for, uh, for and promoting action to combat modern slavery. It does charge me to raise community awareness of modern slavery. It does charge me to address risks of modern slavery in supply chains. Since the 1st of July this year, New South Wales government buyers who spend over $30 billion annually are obliged not to buy products of modern slavery. The Modern Slavery Act charges me to oversee those efforts in various ways. And so it's with those obligations in mind that I offer these remarks tonight. The story I wanna share with you tonight is the story of the power that we have here in New South Wales to help prevent and remedy modern slavery, even when it occurs far away from our shores, even in a place like Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in the People's Republic of China, which I'll call Xinjiang. At the heart of this story is a question. What price freedom? We live in a notionally free market system, but what is the price being paid by the people who make the cheap cotton garments, the tomato sauce, the vinyl flooring that this market furnishes? What's the price being paid by the workers who produce the polysilicon that's used in the solar panels we're all turning to as we seek to arrest climate change? Is the enslavement of Uyghur workers to make these goods a price that we're willing to pay for them? And if not, what price premium would you pay for slave-free products? If part of that price is not only a retail price, but a delay, for example, a delay in the transition to renewables, is that a price you'd be willing to pay? The answers that we collectively fashion to these questions will tell us a lot. They'll tell us about modern slavery, about the international order, but also about what we hold dear. After all, what you buy says a lot about what you value. To answer these questions, I think we need to understand three things. First, how the liberal international order sometimes generates modern slavery. Second, why, particularly in the context of Xinjiang, modern slavery is emerging as a flashpoint in international affairs. And third, how thinking about modern slavery as a system failure may help us figure out what we can do about it. So let's begin with some vexing questions. How can a liberal international order leave 28 million people in modern slavery? That's by some accounts more people enslaved than at any given point in history. How can we call a system that denies freedom to one in every 285 people alive, and even more if we limit our sample to women and girls, a free market? And why has modern slavery risen by 20% in just five years, according to the International Labour Organization? Well, scholarship offers some clear answers. Modern slavery arises where nefarious actors take advantage of institutional weakness to exploit vulnerable people. Global victimization has increased by 20% in five years, largely because there are more vulnerable people, thanks to COVID, conflict, and climate change. 
Now in around 44% of cases worldwide, the vulnerable people are those, usually women and girls, forced into marriage. In 48% of cases, the people are workers forced to work against their will in private workplaces. And in 8% of cases, it's the state that forces people to work. Now in the commercial context where I'll focus tonight, modern slavery arises where employers see the risks and costs of coercion being outstripped by the resulting increase in profit. Modern slavery is therefore more likely in informal and so-called low-skill work undertaken in isolation from communities. Low rates of worker organization can also increase risks as can industry concentration and regulatory capture, as we see, for example, in say the palm oil sector in Southeast Asia or beef production in Brazil. Corruption is often key to entrenching and protecting modern slavery. So modern slavery is particularly likely in weakly regulated se sectors with low barriers to entry, where workforces are vulnerable to coercion, perhaps because they have temporary migrant status, don't speak the local language, or are from a marginalised group. And in Australia, we have those conditions in play, in, for example, in sectors such as the cleaning sector, facilities management, horticulture, and the sex industry. Now think for a moment about the effects of globalization and indeed trade liberalization over the last 40 years on industrial organization and that vulnerability. In many sectors, trade liberalization has created long global value chains where the goods sold to final buyers have passed through many stages of design and production, often spread around the globe. States with pools of large, uh, large pools of low skill labor have competed for capital investment by increasing labor market flexibility and lowering labor costs. That's why the center of garment production, for example, has bounced around the world over recent decades from Western countries to China, to Southeast Asia, to Bangladesh, to Ethiopia, and now back to Myanmar. The unintended result of this, however, is the profit funnels up the value chain to major brands while risk trickles down to workers. Take the move to ultra fast fashion by companies like Boohoo and Shine. Their business model is based on ultra fast introduction and turnover of styles, copying posts by social media influencers with prices dropping ever lower. The model works by forcing contractors to accept ultra fast and risky production schedules and unequal payment terms. So contractors deal with that risk by pushing it down onto their subcontractors who in turn cost cascade it down the supply chain. And ultimately the buck stops with the worker. Now, don't get me wrong, globalization has been a powerful engine of growth worldwide. It's raised wages and household incomes, and it has improved women's workforce participation around the world. But at the same time, it's disconnected consumers and investors from the people that make their products and increasingly their services. It's increased not only the physical distance that goods travel from production to consumption, but also the moral distance. And it, it's in that gap, that yawning empathy and accountability gap that modern slavery flourishes. Yet the reality is that that business model is not sustainable over the long term because modern slavery, it turns out, leaves us all worse off. The evidence shows that by drawing capital to low productivity sectors, it reduces wages for all workers, reduces innovation, and even reduces gender equality. It reduces multiplier effects in the economy as individuals are transformed from being both workers and consumers into, in Professor Kevin Bale's memorable phrase, disposable people. It increases disease burden and healthcare costs and it even worsens environmental outcomes from carbon emissions to deforestation, biodiversity loss and overfishing. So why does it persist? because modern slavery is a rent-taking system. Powerful individuals and firms use their political and economic power, including in global value chains, to legitimize what is formally illegal, treating people as if they're owned. And they reap the rewards, lower labor costs, higher profits, political buy-in. Or we could say with a small tweak, we reap the rewards, cheaper jeans and pet food, higher stock dividends, higher standards of living. 
So while abolishing slavery may leave us all better off in the long run, in the short run, it means disruption, it means system change, and it means loss of vested interests. So the conclusion should be clear, ending slavery will come at a price, even if in the long term, it does leave us all better off. So where does Xinjiang fit into this picture? The plight of Uyghur and other minority peoples in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in the People's Republic of China throws all of this into stark relief. Modern slavery and related human rights abuses are so widespread and systematic in Xinjiang that the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights recently concluded that they may constitute crimes against humanity. Several of Australia's allies have recognised what's happening in Xinjiang as genocide. Now, modern slavery in Xinjiang is both different to and alike to the pattern of modern slavery in global supply chains that I've just described. It's different because the coercion that forces Uyghurs to work is not introduced by employers as a profit maximizing strategy inside the workplace, but rather by the state as part of a larger strategy of governance and social transformation in the region, forcing Uyghurs into workplaces in the first place. But it's alike to what I've been describing because the state strategy plays out within a commercial context and specifically in the context of forcing Uyghur forced labor into global value chains. So allow me to explain a little more. Xinjiang, which literally means new frontier in Mandarin, has long been perceived by China's rulers as a gateway through which disruptive forces from the West can enter the Han ethnic core of Eastern China. President Xi Jinping's father, Xi Zhongshun served as the top Communist Party official in the region during the 1950s, while it was being brought firmly under the control of the People's Republic of China. Beijing's strategy focused at this point on stabilization through Han settler colonialism. A military garrison, the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, known as the Bingtuan, oversaw large scale land reclamation and signification with significant transfers of poor Han agricultural workers into the region. Now, some local minority workers and students were forced into agricultural work, but the focus at this stage was on Han control and exploitation of resources, not on integration of ethnic minorities. And here, I think we have to pause our story for a moment. It would be borderline hypocritical not to note the parallels between Beijing's policies towards Xinjiang in that period and London's policies towards Australia's development in the 18th and 19th centuries. Both cases involve a development strategy based on military-led settler colonialism. Both involve strategies that seek to forcibly incorporate land, natural resources, and ultimately labor into global trade and capital circuits. And just as in Australia, dispossession and forced displacement of our First Nations led ultimately and tragically to state-sponsored assimilation through family separation, forced labour and internment, so have policies played out in Xinjiang. 2014 was the key inflection point. An indiscriminate attack in March 2014, allegedly carried out by Olga separatists at the Kunming railway station left 31 dead and 143 injured. Beijing quickly came to see separatism and violent extremism in Xinjiang as a threat to broader Chinese stability. In a key speech, President Xi framed stability in Xinjiang as the foundation for the stability of the entire nation. Under the guise of counterterrorism, a characterization that I have to say was roundly criticized in the recent report of the United Nations Officer, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, under that guise, Beijing set a new course for governance of Xinjiang, a much more heavy handed interventionist policy, a strategy of proletarianization that forced Xinjiang's minority populations to give up their traditional lifestyles and integrate into global commerce. To achieve this, the Chinese Communist Party has unleashed what President Xi has called, quote, the weapons of the People's Democratic Dictatorship extending surveillance infrastructure deep into religious, political and family spaces. Besides technological data and cyber surveillance, the Becoming Family campaign has placed a million Han guests into the homes and bedrooms of minority host families 
to monitor the, and report on their host's private lives and their thinking. Under a de-extremification regulation, since 2017, Beijing has constructed a large number of so-called vocational skills and education and training centers across Xinjiang. Constructed behind high walls, barbed wire and watchtowers, this network of, quote, concentration camps, unquote, has been described as China's Gulag Archipelago, to use Solzhenitsyn's famous Cold War phrase. Between one and two million people from Uyghur, Kazakh and other minorities are estimated to have been involuntarily detained in these residential centers in recent years, where they undergo a program of quote, behavioral correction, unquote, based on Maoist political re-education practices. There's extensive evidence that these centers are the sites of massive human rights abuse, including hooding, shackling and handcuffing, sexual and physical assault, torture, such as prolonged confinement in the infamous tiger chair, shoot to kill orders for those attempting escape or causing security disturbances. Now, re-education through labor is a key part of this program. In international fora, the Chinese government represents these centers as an affirmative action campaign to improve the quote, employability of workers and promote quote, stable employment for disadvantaged minority workers. At the same time within the party, Leaders describe it as a way to prevent minorities, quote, infection by separatism or religious extremism. Detainees are forced to work in factories built adjacent to these camps, often with major tax and financial incentives from Beijing. And the government typically pays enterprises a fee for each trainee that they employ. Now, in some supply chains, this government support lowers production costs by as much as 30% making these firms highly competitive in global markets. And after workers graduate from these centers, they're often sent in to work in factories in Eastern China, with the government again playing a significant role in connecting supply and demand. Now, separate to these centers, the government runs a second parallel poverty alleviation through labor transfer schemes. Since 2014, that scheme has moved hundreds of thousands of ethnic minority workers into labor intensive industry, notably cotton, tomatoes, and polysilicon in Xinjiang, and electronic, automotive, and apparel factories in Eastern China. Worker placement schemes like this don't necessarily violate international norms and standards, and they have in fact had an important place in rural development efforts in recent years. But we have to be careful about guarding against coercion, especially when those programs are adopted in the context of large socio-cultural transformation and security efforts. And in Xinjiang, rather than safeguarding against coercion, the implementation of the scheme seems to have invited it. Teams of officials have been sent to visit Uyghurs in their homes to coerce them into the poverty alleviation through labor transfer scheme. To refuse is to risk yourself and your family being sent to a vocational skills and education training center. This is what scholars call structural coercion. Workers may present to employers and to social auditors of supply chains as willing to be there, but that is because they have no choice but to do so. The reckoning in the West comes not simply from the growing awareness of the scale and the gravity of these crimes, it also comes from a realization that we're buying products made by enslaved people. Around one in five garments made worldwide likely contains cotton made with Xinjiang forced labor. And the figure may be higher in Australia given our trading patterns. Xinjiang also accounts for around 18% of global trade by volume in processed tomato products such as tomato paste and tomato sauce. So if you go to a supermarket and check a jar of tomato paste, it probably says product of Italy. But because of the way those global supply chains work, it's in fact quite likely to be diluted concentrate produced in Xinjiang. And then there's solar power. A staggering 90% or more of the on-grid solar energy produced for OECD markets is thought to be made by solar panels that contain polysilicon from Xinjiang. In all three of these sectors, there's now significant evidence of modern slavery. Hence the reckoning. A rapidly growing list of countries from the United States to Japan, from Mexico to Norway are rethinking commercial ties to Xinjiang and moving to exclude imports of forced labor goods more generally. 
In the United States, the Uyghur uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act was adopted just before Christmas with just one contrary vote across both houses of Congress. It creates a rebuttable presumption that any supply chain passing through Xinjiang is tainted by forced labor. US Customs and Border Protection can turn those goods back at the point of entry to US markets. And enforcement action has already affected billions of dollars worth of goods with a particular impact on the cotton and solar sectors. The US Trade Representative is now developing a more generally applicable, <coughs> global, applicable global trade strategy to combat forced labor. The European Union is currently considering a proposal championed by the Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, to ban import and sale of goods made with forced labor. The G7 has committed to action and countries as diverse as Canada, France, Germany, Japan, Mexico, Netherlands, Norway, New Zealand, and the UK have either adopted supply chain due diligence and disclosure requirements or are currently contemplating them. Now here in Australia, the last parliament also considered an import ban on goods made with forced labor and it actually passed through the Senate. It didn't get through the House of Reps before parliament was prorogued. But the Australian Labor Party, now in government in Canberra, committed at the last election to create a federal anti-slavery commissioner who will publish an annual list of countries, regions, industries, and products with a high risk of modern slavery, including forced labor, and companies importing from those places would be required to prove goods are not made with forced labor. Nor is the government activity limited to trade measures. One database counts 324 such measures worldwide, encompassing import bans, export controls, targeted financial and travel sanctions, business guidance, and in a limited number of cases, capital market controls. And this is interesting. Shareholders and investors are increasingly taking their own action outside government frameworks. We've seen shareholder proposals at Apple, Disney, Nike, and Volkswagen recently on Xinjiang issues. And here in Australia, 37 institutional investors with $7.8 trillion assets under management are engaging firms to address Xinjiang forced labor in supply chains. So what's going on here? Is this simply a product of anti-China hawkishness? Is it uh, concern about environmental, social and governance issues, so-called ESG gone haywire? Or is liberal laissez-faire suddenly passe? My answer put simply is that we've entered a period of systemic competition at the international level. Great powers aren't competing just for power in the international system now, but to control the political values and purpose that animates the system. Just two weeks ago, Josep Borrell, the EU foreign policy, harking back to Bill Clinton's famous phrase at the beginning of the 1990s said, remember this sentence, it is the identity stupid. It's no longer the economy, it is the identity. Now, what did he mean by identity? Well, a clue came about a week later when in another speech, he contrasted the European garden where law and rights hold sway to the jungle outside Europe where might is right. Now his word choice was poor and he was duly criticized for exhibiting a neo-colonial Eurocentric mindset. But as his subsequent apology post tried to explain, the point he was trying to make was a distinction between the liberalism of the European political order and the illiberalism of some other political and social systems. Increasingly, Western political leaders see modern slavery and forced labor in global value chains as a flashpoint in this emerging systemic competition. The German labor and social affairs minister, Hubertus Heil, spelled this out again just three weeks ago. He was asked about a corporate human rights due diligence law currently being debated in the European Parliament. And he said this, Europe is more than a single market. It's also a political community with values that tries to combine democracy, a market economy and the welfare state. And we know that politically and economically we're in systemic competition with other states. We're challenged by how we deal with other economic areas in South America, Africa and Asia. We have the task of building fair partnerships with mutual benefits and not turning a blind eye to forced labor and child labor. The planned European supply chain law, he continued, will help us because non-European companies will fall under its scope. In this way, 
companies from autocratic states will also be obliged to comply with our standards if they want to do business in the EU. It's the identity, stupid. Something similar is actually afoot in Washington. Kurt Campbell, who, as you'd know, leads White House policy in Asia and Rush Doshi, one of his key lieutenants, penned a seminal article, How America Can Shore Up Asian Order, published in January 2021 in Foreign Affairs, where they drew on Henry Kissinger's analysis of great power competition in Europe in the 19th century to argue that what Asia is missing today isn't just a balance of power, but an order that regional actors see as legitimate. And they were explicit. They said that that legitimacy will depend on rules, quote, around supply chains, standards, investment regimes, and trade agreements, unquote. These are the key shapers of the Biden administration's Asia policy, telling us that regulation of supply chains is now central to creating and maintaining a legitimate order in Asia. That's the context in which we need to understand debates over Xinjiang forced labor. Now, it's not unusual for shifts in the international balance of power to reveal these values-based fault lines in the international political economy. Many of those who follow these issues know the late great Harvard professor, John Ruggie, as the father of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the so-called Ruggie principles. But before he developed that lingua franca of the area, John was a renowned scholar of international political economy. In a famous 1982 piece, where Campbell and Doshi looked to Kissinger, John looked to uh, Karl Polanyi, the Hungarian-born author of a hugely influential but rather dense volume, after The Great Transformation, for lessons about how shifts in the balance of power play out around these values fault lines. Polanyi had explained how the liberal international order of the 19th century was actually constructed by great powers in service to their domestic liberal political economies. As Polanyi famous put it, famously put it, laissez-faire was planned. John Ruggie used Polanyi's work to create a general framework for explaining realignments in the international system, which he then applied to the Bretton Woods emergence after World War II. And he famously described that period as embedded liberalism, liberal in the sense of maintaining an international free market project, but embedded in the sense that international market forces are embedded in a national framework, allowing governments to intervene in capital and currency markets in order to protect employment and welfare. I think John's framework helps us understand what's going on in this moment now. It is an effort perhaps belated to realign power and purpose in the international trading system. In John's own terms, the neoliberal project of the last 50 years has been an effort to disembed liberalism, a deliberate project funded by wealthy patrons and prosecuted by an array of think tanks, political parties, and indeed media outlets, aimed at freeing international commerce and in particular capital from local constraints. Today, the international order that has created global value chains, offshore tax havens, free movement of capital is being challenged by two forces each of which is ironically in a way an unexpected consequence of the success of that project of disembedding liberalism. First, the rapid rise of communist China, itself propelled by China's participation in the liberal, liberal trading system, but financed by Wall Street, the city of London and European capital. And second, by climate change precipitated by the accelerating burning of fossil fuels that's accompanied globalization. And both of these forces are now forcing this reckoning with the sometimes illiberal negative social impacts of the liberal international order as we've known it. Modern slavery, particularly in Xinjiang and particularly in its ties, I would argue, to solar supply chains, throws all of that into stark relief and forces us to grapple with the shortcomings of the system we've built. It's forcing a reckoning around the political impacts, the purpose of our economic uh, systems. And it forces us to ask, what price are we prepared to pay to defend and fix the system to realign power and purpose? What I'm arguing is that modern slavery is a system failure. It's an unintended consequence of global political economy that allows risks to be externalized onto the most vulnerable without real accountability or remedy. 
Fixing that will require a system response, but it's not going to go uncontested. We know from other cases where modern slavery systems have been disrupted that the rent takers fight back, and that's what we're seeing happen again in Xinjiang. Western efforts to call out human rights abuses and to regulate supply chains passing through Xinjiang have been met by a furious backlash from Beijing with many components, a full court media and diplomatic push describing the allegation as the lie of the century, the adoption of a domestic anti-sanctions law criminalizing cooperation with foreign supply chain due diligence efforts, mm -hmm. harassment and intimidation of auditors and, raid and raids on auditing firms, government stoked online vitriol against campaigners and researchers, including a number of significant Australian voices and organized government boycotts and administrative harassment of Western retail brands operating in China, including major players such as H&M, Walmart and Intel. The good news is that we know it's possible to overcome that kind of resistance. We've seen examples in other countries of diplomats, buyers, investors, unions, civil society working together to overcome that resistance. And the, the key point that that leads to is that we all have a part to play. If modern slavery is a system failure, we have to change the system and we all play a part in that system. What you buy shows what you value. Now here in New South Wales, I think we have a unique opportunity to contribute to this change with world leading laws on government procurement. So I'll be working hard in the years ahead to help government buyers avoid buying goods and services produced through modern slavery with goods from Xinjiang high on my list of risky products. What we do here in New South Wales won't necessarily end modern slavery in Xinjiang, but just as with climate action, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be playing our part, making our contribution to addressing those negative externalities of the system that we all benefit from. So next time you go to buy your business shirts or your jeans, or to buy some tomato sauce at the supermarket, or if you're thinking about investing in a renewables firm, ask yourself whether perhaps those products were produced in part through the forced labor of a Uyghur man, woman, or child in Xinjiang. So I'll leave you tonight with that one simple question. What price are you prepared to pay for freedom? Thank you. What, a, what an eloquent uh, set of propositions to enable us to find our way into a topic of, of great complexity and, and to bring our attention to the international dimensions, which are fraught with a further range of difficulties. For example, the focus on Xinjiang obviously can be seen as part of a current attitude to China, which has been led as part of some much wider and different strategic uh, uh, preoccupations or discussions about the ways in which goods are produced in India, and Bangladesh, Vietnam, and Indonesia is going to be attacked as a way to for Western countries trying to stop them having their chance at, at economic development. But it's not for me to ask questions, it's for the audience. We've got the best part of half an hour. So shall we start with something online just for change? No, let's have a hand up in the audience then. Please wait for the mic. Um, this might be over the top, but when you were describing the work camps in Xinjiang, uh, I couldn't help remember um, Mishka and I being at um, Auschwitz and seeing the inscription over the gate. Arbeit macht frei, work makes free. Um, is that totally over the top or uh, is there perhaps some parallel there? Well, I think we need to be very cautious in uh, overly quickly reducing everything to Nazi uh, precedents. That said, it is very clear that the programs and practices in place in the vocational skills, education and training centers draw on a long Maoist tradition 
of uh, re-education through labor. Lao Jiao is the Mandarin shorthand term for it, um, which looks to recreate the consciousness of the person undergoing the re-education, the political consciousness. Are there parallels there to the uh, philosophies that underpinned the strategy of the final solution? Frankly, that's for scholars of both China and Nazi Germany to answer, not, not for me. But I think what it does emphasize is that we are talking about widespread and systematic grave human rights abuse. And there is growing evidence of this, very widespread evidence now. This is not speculative. This is not just about satellite imagery and reading into uh, scarce data. This is about first-hand testimonies. In fact, just recently, a book of 100 first-hand testimonies was published. We know from these accounts, we know from government documents, this is really critical. Professor Adrian Zenz and others have done incredible work to show from leaked Chinese government data, speeches and records, that this is a deliberate strategy uh, and set of interlocking policies and infrastructures in place in Xinjiang. This isn't, this isn't uh, convergent evolution. The, the unlucky happenstance of a lot of private employers creating dormitories, for example, for their workers. There is deliberate government design and execution in these policies. There is funding, there is infrastructure, there is government participation in the movement of work parties into and particularly out of Xinjiang. So we know this is very deliberate and that is why, don't take it from me, take it from the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, who published an extensive report on this under very considerable political pressure not to do so. On her last day in office, the outgoing former president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, pu uh, published this report. You can find it easily online. That is really a very powerful signal of the gravity of the situation that we're facing. Next question. Um, thank you for your speech. Uh, clearly, you are fully aware, and you've said it several times, that the vast majority of solar panels in the world are made by the Uyghurs under forced slavery. What are you doing to tell the Australian people that? Like every election we've had now for the last 10 years it's let's have more solar farms let's you know renewables renewables here renewables there all good stuff but two people realize that the vast majority of the solar panels we are putting in are made by slave labor and it's one thing for a government to try to regulate imports from this area but seriously if the people who are paying that extra money will pay less money for a Chinese manufactured Uyghur slave labor developed solar panel, would they be willing to pay 20% more for someone, for some other country to pay for it? And I just don't think they're being told. People don't wanna hear bad news. So they don't go into the net internet to see where solar panels are made, but it's up to the government to actually tell them. So I would say that the problem is even worse than you describe in this respect, that even if you do want to buy slave-free solar panels, good luck to you in this market. And the reason for that is that the key component that goes into solar panels that is, we believe, tainted by forced labour in Xinjiang is, is polysilicon. And that is a commodity. As a commodity, it's even the sources that are tainted are admixed in with polysilicon from slave-free factories. We don't know where it is in the supply chain. The reality is that the solar industry is used to being the good guys. They don't necessarily have the internal capabilities to deal with these kinds of challenging questions around negative social impact. Now, under regulatory pressure, like the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act, I have to say they're moving very fast to develop those capabilities. So I applaud that and I want to try and support that. But at the same time, if you're a buyer, of solar energy or solar panels here in Australia, a consumer or indeed a major buyer, 
you're going to struggle to find slave-free uh, supply. Even if you do, it gets harder. Even if you do, the chances are that that slave-free panel, which is made with polysilicon from a place we know doesn't have slavery, for example, there's a supplier in Germany, it's probably made by a manufacturer for our market. That manufacturer over here is still taking Xinjiang polysilicon to make other panels to sell to other markets. Now, if we pay a premium for slave-free products here, we're just crop subsidizing all of those people over there who continue to buy slave-made goods. So the answer here is not just a question of foreign policy, and I would reiterate, I am not a foreign policy actor. I am not making any recommendations to the government how to conduct its foreign policy. But the answer is partly about procurement policy, but also industrial policy. This is an industrial policy question for a complex transnational supply chain. We know that solar panel production can and will move in response to tariffs, in response to government subsidies, in response to industrial policy. It, we know that because it's happened several times in the short life of the solar supply chain commercially worldwide. So there is a solution here, but what it requires is governments at multiple levels along the value chain to work together to develop a proactive industrial policy to create slave-free polysilicon and to do it with producers who aren't then taking that reward while over here still trading in slave made goods and we don't have that yet we the discussions are emerging but if you want to create a polysilicon plant it takes you minimum 18 months probably considerably longer than that and about half a billion dollars per plant now the other aspect of it is that polysilicon is basically just heated up quartz you have to get it to very very high temperature and the way you do that is with electricity. Where do you get the electricity from? In Xinjiang, it comes from thermal coal. So the solar panels we're buying are made by burning coal. So we think we're creating something that is low carbon emissions. It is for the longer term, but its production was actually incredibly carbon intensive. Now we have access to plenty of quartz in this country. Uh, we hope soon to have access to low cost solar electricity. Um, we have hydro, we have growing wind market. Why are we not having a conversation about getting into the polysilicon production game here in this country? Why are we so fixated on hydrogen? So to all of those environmental and climate leaders who are doing great work by, for example, creating solar farms to export solar power to Southeast Asia, I say that is fantastic. What's the human cost of what you're doing? And what leadership are you going to show to make sure that your supply chains are slavery free and to assure the government that's investing in them and the buyers of these products and this energy that you are committed to anti-slavery? Thank you. An online question. Uh, thanks. We have an online question uh, from Andrew Young. Uh, he asks, what are the advantages of having state anti-slavery commissioners in addition to a federal anti-slavery commissioner when it comes to combating modern slavery? Yeah, it's a great question. Short answer is we don't know yet because we don't have a federal anti-slavery commissioner. But I'll tell you what I, I think the answer may turn out to be. Um, slavery happens where populations are vulnerable, where a population is vulnerable, where the state has trouble getting to them. Now, a federal commissioner in this country is going to be dealing with federal level processes. Australian federal police play a critical role in this, trade policy, industrial policy, all of those things. State level commissioners, as I've been learning rapidly over the last three months in the role, have a unique potential to engage frontline agencies and civil society on the ground that can actually find and directly assist and support those vulnerable people and victims. So that includes the health sector, federally funded to some extent, but state run and operated. Uh, it includes multicultural infrastructure, really critical. A lot of our vulnerable populations here in Australia are culturally and linguistically diverse populations. 
It includes potentially the education sector. It certainly includes family services, child protection, um, social services, those kinds of organisations which have a very strong state component. So my view is there's absolutely room for both. We're used in this country to uh, quite complex federal state relationships and there are ways to ensure they're operating within a common framework. We have that common framework in a sense already in place. There is a Commonwealth National Action Plan against modern slavery. And I think very wisely, the, the state law that creates my role requires me to align the strategic plan I'm developing with that Commonwealth framework. So I think there's plenty of room for action at multiple levels. And I'd even say going down beyond the state government level, you know, there's a local government component to this as well, because often it's down right on the ground where we're really going to be able to reach out and offer a hand, helping hand to people who need it. I have an idea of how many people here in the hall have a, a question that they'd like to ask. That's one. Okay, well, that's an easy choice. <laughs> um, I'm Ashruka Parati and I'm an intern at the Institute. Um, I worked with uh, IGM for developing their Operation Spotfire report, which worked to basically highlight the vulnerabilities in global supply chains, especially the modern slavery statements um, in Australia. So we found out that the weakest link is actually due diligence and the willingness of businesses to actually implement the ethical considerations that are already in place. So that is what I wanted to ask you. How do you reckon we can compel, the government in particular can compel businesses to implement these ethical considerations, um, given the fact that there are gaps in these, but there are also certain frameworks that are already in place through the Modern Slavery Act? That's a great question. There are two different regimes we need to explain quickly to answer that question. The first that, is it Ashika, is that correct? Yeah. Ashika was referring to is a federal reporting regime. Any uh, company in Australia with over 100 million annual revenues has to report an issue of modern slavery statement annually, explaining how it's finding and addressing modern slavery risks in its supply chains. Um, they have not been subject to penalties for failing to do so or if they put in a report that, you know, is window dressing. That is under review currently. Professor John McMillan, currently at ANU, but many of you would know him from many of his, any one of his many esteemed roles as uh, commissioner in vari at various levels here in the state and federally, is conducting a review which will report in March. The federal government has said that it will, an election commitment was to introduce penalties uh, around that regime. Exactly what for remains to be seen. So that's one regime. Then there's the regime that I'm part of at the state level, which uh, formally applies only to government buyers, but mandates me to work with the New South Wales Procurement Board and the Auditor General to consider the effectiveness of due diligence. That's a really interesting word when you stop and think about it. What do we mean when we say the effectiveness of due diligence to address modern slavery risk? I have a discussion paper online talking all about that if you'd like to read it, Ashka. It's on my website in the Department of Communities and Justice website. Let me give you sort of the key highlight. I believe effectiveness is about reducing risk to people. So what that means is that we need government buyers to think about how their procurement practices work to reduce risk to people. That's pretty hard when you stop and think about it for a procurement officer sitting in a big government agency who's just running a tender, there's a lot of different moving parts there to figure out how they can identify whether their procurement choices are having an impact on a social outcome how they can collect the data on that and measure that. So this is gonna be quite a long change process. It's systems change. Back to this point, modern slavery is a system failure. We have to adapt the systems we have in place. And just as with climate action, it's gonna require a full court press. This is not a niche issue. We have to be anti-slavery in our orientation across all parts of our economy, just as we are being for climate action across all parts of the economy. So a lot of work to do. The report you mentioned is a valuable source of learning. International Justice Mission has played a critical role in this area. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to you further if you 
want to geek out on it with me afterwards, Ashika. Geek out, I like it. We have a question online. Um, our next question is about the World Cup. Uh, the Qatar World Cup has been controversial, not only for Qatar's exploitation of migrant workers, uh, but also for the firms that have been involved in the stadiums also being involved in building various facilities in China. How does uh, Australia and the global community's involvement in and response to these world events reinforce and show our commitment to abolishing modern slavery? Well, I have to declare a conflict of interest on this one. Uh, my wife, Rachel Davis, was the temp was for several years until they closed themselves down, the chair of the uh, independent, unpaid, very important, human rights advisory board to FIFA. And they worked closely with the Qatar authorities, with unions, with human rights activists, with the workers to try and address some of these issues in the lead up to the World Cup. So I have, I have a personal interest that I should declare. The reports from that board are all publicly available online. You can go and look at them. And what that's led to is a very interesting process now underway. Board is now closed. She's no longer involved. But workers in uh, Qatar are now, including the Building and Woodworkers uh, International Union, working with the government organizing body to think very hard about what is the legacy for workers in Qatar of the World Cup. One legacy we know is that there have been injuries and deaths to some extent on World Cup sites, but more in the infrastructure development around the World Cup. There's also been positive change in the, leg in the legal framework, but in terms of access to remedy and the ability of workers to you to organize, to raise their concerns uh, after the World Cup, will those changes stick? That's the central question that's being very actively discussed now. I think what we see here now um, from our sports teams in Australia is the really unique power of sport in Australia to lead public opinion on issues, again, like the environment. And I applaud the work that, you know, the diamonds, uh, that Pat Cummins and others are doing to show leadership on that. Let's see them raise their voices also on the human rights impacts of mega sporting events uh, where they can. A good question for the Socceroos, how are they going to grapple with this issue when they get to Qatar? Are they taking up the offers from the professional sports unions which are out there to meet with workers and be educated? I honestly don't know the answer to that. They may well be. So there's huge power in sport in Australia to influence and lead public opinion. And I'd love to see more sportsmen and women using that influence and leverage to uh, live their values on this, just as they are now so bravely on climate change. Well, I'm afraid we have to stop our question time, at least at the formal level there, but I'm sure that Dr. Cocaine will be happy to natter with you all uh, if, you, if you want to stay on for a few moments. But let me just say that, uh, our year isn't over yet. We've got one more uh, formal event coming up, an event of this kind, on the 8th of November, when the uh, Vietnamese ambassador to Australia will be addressing us on his country's relationship with us. Prior to that, on the 1st of November, you might be expecting an event, but because it's Melbourne Cup Day, we're not having one. We, we're not sure how many of you would actually uh, turn up if we did. However, that week we will put out our next edition of columns from Dover Cottages with our recommended readings and broadcasts on international issues. So that's what lies in the future. But for now, to finish our event this evening, I'd like to ask Grace Papworth, one of our interns, to give a vote of thanks. Um, I'd just like to thank James for contextualizing the system failure of modern slavery in a domestic and international life. And I personally look forward to seeing the positive changes on a New South Wales and federal level that we take um, under new legislation. And I'd like to formally extend a vote of thanks.